Within the United States, the 1960s and 70s was an era of dissent, protest, and revolution. During these decades, marginalized groups of all kinds launched a full-scale assault on the ideologies and institutions that had kept them from participating fully and equally in American society. This struggle against oppression took on many forms, and it led to a variety of rights movements, including civil rights for black Americans and other racial minorities, women's rights, indigenous rights, and disability rights. Those who participated in these movements demonstrated that racism, sexism, classism, ageism, and ableism were all alive and well within the United States. Moreover, in challenging the bigotries and prejudices that had long relegated them to second-class citizenship, minority rights activists succeeded in bringing about a number of important changes to society, changes that brought the disempowered new freedoms, new rights, and new weapons with which to fight against the forces of injustice and inequality. Importantly, many of the freedoms and rights that activists fought for revolved around sexuality. That this was the case owed largely to the fact that the country's sexual culture went through a number of rather dramatic changes during this period. Due to a combination of economic, technological, cultural, and demographic developments, a wave of sexual liberalism swept across the country, resulting in the creation of a society that boasted more tolerant, permissive attitudes toward forms of sex that previously had been considered unacceptable. Whereas previously, America had been tightly bound by an ethic of marital sexuality that frowned on any sexual activity outside of marriage, now pre- and extramarital sex found new levels of acceptance. And with the advent of new contraceptive options like the pill, the ties linking sex to reproduction were severed, leading to an expansion of erotic opportunities and a heightened emphasis on non-procreative types of sexual intercourse. Sexual practices like cunning linguists and fellatio gained acceptance, and for the first time, pornography entered mainstream American life, as can be seen in the popularity of films like Deep Throat, and also sex manuals like The Joy of Sex. Also, commercial advertisements that featured explicitly sexual scenarios. This validation of erotic pleasure created not just a bona fide sex industry, but also gave rise to a more sexualized society within the United States. To be sure, old sexual mores were not completely uprooted, and in fact, in the 1980s, they returned with a vengeance. But during the 1960s and 70s, attitudes towards sex and sexuality were changing, and many Americans rethought their preconceived notions about these things. One reason they did so is because the era's minority rights movements forced them to do so. A prime example of this is second wave feminism. Many women's rights activists were skeptical of the new ethic of sexual liberalism and argued that sexual freedom was often a tool used by men to oppress women. Having tasted the fruits of the sexual revolution, many feminists found it wanting. Some cast a skeptical look at sex itself and contended that women had been defined sexually in terms of what pleased men. Speaking out against rape and sexual harassment, against the patriarchal ideals at play in beauty pageants like the yearly Miss America contest, and against misogynist norms that prevented women from controlling their own bodies, feminists fought for the creation of new laws, policies, and practices that would end women's sexual subordination and make them free and equal citizens. Because of their actions, by the 1970s, most states had revised rape laws, making it easier to gain convictions of female sexual assaulters, getting some states to accept the idea of marital rape, and forcing employers to recognize sexual harassment as an illegal action. Perhaps the biggest victory came in 1973, when in Roe v. Wade, the U.S. Supreme Court eliminated many restrictions on abortion. It was not only feminists who fought against the forces of sexual oppression. So, too, did gay men and women. 
While feminists campaigned for women's reproductive freedoms and exposed the extent to which misogyny and all manner of sexual double standards pervaded society, gay rights activists militated against the system of heterosexual supremacy that pathologized homosexuality and criminalized same-sex sexual relations. Perhaps the biggest spur to the gay rights movement was the Stonewall Riots, which took place between June 22nd and July 3rd, 1969, in response to a police raid on the Stonewall Inn, a popular gay bar. In the aftermath of these riots, during which the inn's patrons resisted arrest and fought back against police violence, a number of gay activist organizations sprang up all across the country, and, taking inspiration from the era's other rights movements, they adopted a public, confrontational approach to securing rights for gays and lesbians. With these developments, gay culture within the United States blossomed as gay bars, churches, health clinics, political clubs, and professional caucuses emerged all across the country. With countless numbers of lesbians and gay men coming out of the closet, gay liberationists pursued numerous objectives, including, one, an end to the ban on the employment of gays and lesbians in state and federal governments, two, the elimination of sodomy from penal and criminal codes, and three, the depathologization of homosexuality as a mental disorder. In what follows, I'd like to take a detailed look at the history of the American gay rights movement of the 1960s and 70s. In particular, I'd like to address the following questions. In answering these questions, I'd like to focus on one particular facet of the gay rights movement, the quest to remove homosexuality from the American Psychiatric Association's official list of mental disorders. In the 1940s and 50s, the leaders of the American psychiatric profession came to believe that homosexuality was pathological, specifically that it was something that resulted from improper child-rearing practices. This was a new idea. In the early 20th century, Sigmund Freud had argued that humanity was innately bisexual, and while he saw homosexuals as a product of impaired development, he believed that there was really nothing wrong with this. Certainly, it was not something that could be cured. Mid-20th century psychiatrists rejected Freud's ideas, and they insisted that both biology and culture naturally drove the human species toward heterosexuality. Whereas Freud and other sexologists had argued that some people were born with an innate homosexual preference, psychiatrists of the 1940s and 50s believed that homosexuality only happened when mothers and fathers failed to provide a proper family environment for their children. The chief culprit here was the overly intimate, overweening mother, who blunted the heterosexual development of their children, mostly their sons, by expressing demasculinizing and feminizing attitudes. Perhaps the mother fostered competitiveness between son and father. Perhaps she inhibited the development of normal relationships between the son and other boys. Regardless, psychiatrists believe that she was at fault. In the classic case, the son was overstimulated sexually by the mother, who thwarted any signs of masculinity. The father rejected the son, accentuating his feelings of competitiveness. In this environment, the father becomes a grave threat, a potential source of injury, and the female genitalia become identified with danger. The heterosexual drive itself is now imbued with harm. It is forced underground. It becomes latent. The most prominent advocate of this theory was Charles Saccharides. He actually contended that homosexuality was pre oedipal and that those who engaged in the practice were also schizophrenic, paranoiac, or in the throes of manic depression. He wrote as follows in defense of this view. Despite these dour views, the psychoanalysts of the 1950s and 60s were quite optimistic about their prospects for quote-unquote curing homosexuals. Despite quite meager results, they insisted that Freud was wrong, and that through reconstructive treatment, one's 
irrational fears of heterosexuality could be resolved. They went to great lengths to try to cure gays and lesbians of their conditions. What did gay men and women think of these ideas? And how did they engage with the psychiatrist who promulgated them? In order to answer these questions, we first need to trace the gay rights movement back to its roots, which lie in the 1950s. In the aftermath of the Second World War, a number of gay Americans sought to continue the campaign to decriminalize homosexuality that had first gained momentum with the rise of sexology around the turn of the century. This was known as the homophile movement, and it gained ground in the 1950s with the foundation of organizations like the Mattachine Society and the Daughters of Belitis. Groups like these were avowedly assimilationist in their aims. By that, we mean that the so-called homophile movement stressed the idea that homosexual men and women were just like their heterosexual counterparts. Both needed air to breathe and food and water to survive. While the two groups might differ in terms of their secondary characteristics, sexual object and gender choice, this underlying commonality was more fundamental, and as such, homosexuals should be given the same human rights as everyone else. So the argument ran. In their arguments, many in the homophile movement drew upon the writings of Ulrichs and other turn-of-the-century sexologists. Like him, they argued that sexuality was biologically determined, and that because of this, homosexuals were not criminals. And secondly, homophile activists tended to argue that their activities should not be targeted for legal repression because, as they put it, what individuals did in the sanctity of their homes was up to them and beyond the reach of the state. This was the assimilationist approach, to say that homosexuals were just like everybody else and as such did not constitute a threat to normative society. In the 1950s, most homophile activists saw psychiatrists as their allies. More than that, they were a much-needed scientific lifeline capable of persuading the rest of society that homosexuals were not willfully depraved individuals trying to break the country's moral code. Psychiatrists, most gays and lesbians believed, were showing through their research that homosexuality was neither a sin nor a crime. Instead, they were showing that it was a sickness. And on this front, there was broad agreement among the Medicines that pathological perspectives were preferable to moral or criminological ones. Promoting the scientific study of homosexuality and the psychiatric search for its origins, homophile activists tried to convince members of the public that homosexuals were not morally responsible for their sexual orientations. The most popular homophile publications were two magazines. One was called The Mattachine Review, and the other was called Ladder. In the pages of these magazines, homophile activists provided space for scientific debate on homosexuality. Many were receptive to the idea that homosexuality was a disease in need of a cure. For example, one review of psychiatrist Abram Cardner's book Sex and Morality accepted the psychiatrist's view that homosexuality resulted in, quote, developmental vulnerabilities and acquired weakness in masculinity. The reviewer went on to state that homosexuality was in fact a crippling condition, stating that, quote, many of us homosexuals regard our inversion as a handicap because it protrudes a complete life. And no life is complete emotionally or biologically without the extension of love and the upbringing of children of one's own. And this limitation on our lives imposed upon us in our childhood could have been prevented in most cases. To boast of being glad for an exclusively homosexual condition is but a defense mechanism. Interestingly, with the passage of time, gay activist views underwent substantial modification. By the 1960s, what had been an alliance with psychiatry had transformed into full-blown animosity and rivalry, which often bordered on outright hatred. What propelled these changes, and how did they influence the trajectory of the gay rights movement? These are things we'll get into in our second lecture of the week. For now, in addition to the questions I've already posted, let's consider the following. <laughs> 